Now, let's talk about some basic rules, radiologic rules. I'm going to tell you something that's going to be on your test, but in real life, you don't have to know. And let me explain why. Basic rule, every time you get an x-ray of a long bone, you must see the joint above and below. The reason you don't have to know that in real life is the x-ray tech will always, always get the joint above and below. If you ask for a femur x-ray, and even if you said to the x-ray tech, I just need the femur, they would do the joint above and below. But on the test, they will ask you that very specifically. They will say, do you need to get the joint above and below proximal and distal to a long bone when you're getting an x-ray? Yes, yes, yes. Because you may not have a fracture of that long bone, but you could have an injury or a dislocation of the joint proximal or distal. Again, what's the word that I always use? Safe, safe, safe. All right. Now, let's talk about someone who comes in with a fractured clavicle, collarbone. Common? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Generally speaking, we don't operate, generally speaking, on clavicle fractures. Years ago, we used to put them in a figure of eight splint. And maybe some of you remember the figure of eight splint. We don't do that anymore. For the test in life, we just put them in a sling. Let me tell you why we don't use the figure of eight. The figure of eight dressing is relatively complex. And here's what happened. You put someone in a figure of eight, they would go home, their figure of eight dressing would become undone and they would end up coming back to the emergency room just to have their dressing redone. We just don't do it anymore. The treatment is with a sling. All right. Now, let's talk about some shoulder dislocations. A guy comes in and they just hurt their shoulder and they look like they're shaking hands. They wanna shake hands. Their arm is like this, shaking hands. They have pain in their shoulder and they look like they want to shake hands. And they have a little bit of numbness in their deltoid, in their deltoid. So they look like they're shaking hands. They have pain in their shoulder and they have numbness in their deltoid. That is anterior dislocation of the shoulder. Common, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Some people can dislocate by moving the wrong way their shoulder and it'll dislocate anteriorly. Some people even call it subluxation of the shoulder. But for your purposes and for the test, it's the anterior dislocation. It's usually relatively small trauma, and you reduce it by manipulating the shoulder, it's very, very easy. Now, tell you a little movie trivia. If you guys ever saw one of the first Mel Gibson movies called Lethal Weapon, Mel Gibson was a policeman, and he was kind of a rogue policeman. And he would bet his fellow policemen that if you put him in a straitjacket, he could get out of it. And so in the movie, they would put him in a straitjacket and he would get out of the straitjacket by how he would, in the movie, both shoulders, he would anteriorly dislocate his shoulders. And that is how, at least in the movie, he got out of the straitjacket. And then the way he would relocate his shoulder is by smashing it against the wall. Obviously, this is Hollywood. But I want you to understand that anterior dislocation is a common, common thing you see. 
and you will see it frequently. And you will see it in a lot of your friends who are athletes. They, they might say, if I move to some way, if I play tennis a certain way, I can sublux or anterior dislocate. And, and a lot of times they can relocate it themselves. So remember, hands like they're shaking hands and a little bit of anesthesia over the deltoid. Now, let's talk about a totally different dislocation of the shoulder. And that is a posterior dislocation. Guys, a posterior dislocation of the shoulder, big force, big trauma, like someone having a seizure or someone in a car accident and they will come in with their arm against their chest. They will go with their arm against their chest. Guys, a posterior dislocation a lot of times requires anesthesia to relax the muscles to be reduced. So I want you to understand an anterior dislocation, small trauma, shaken hands, a posterior dislocation, big trauma, seizure, things like that, arm against the chest. And, and a lot of times you have to give them anesthesia, both for pain relief and also to uh, reduce the fracture because of the muscles. All right, remember the difference. Okay, let's continue. Generally speaking, if you have a fracture in the mid portion of your radius or ulna, you need surgery. Why? They are puny bones. They are not strong bones. And if they are fractured in the shaft of the ulna or the radius, you generally need surgery, plates and screws. And if you have surgery, test question and life question. And one hour later, the nurse calls you and says, doctor, there's no pulses in this guy's wrist, what's the diagnosis? Compartment syndrome. And you have to do what? Test question, a fasciotomy. Why do they get compartment syndrome here? You remember your anatomy that there is an interosseous membrane between the ulna and the radius. Now, a lot of times you will actually see trauma, especially in terms of people who might have had an altercation with the police. Meaning, let me explain. And I'm a Chicago boy. And policemen used to carry batons or nightsticks. You might have seen this in movies kind of a stick with a handle on it, made of hard rubber. And if someone is doing something wrong and gonna attack the uh, policeman, they would hit them on their forearm and break either the ulna or the radius. And if that happens, you can't, you can't hit someone. By the way, policemen usually don't carry nightsticks anymore. They actually carry a device which is illegal for a civilian to have, but it's called an ASP. And it's a metal device about six inches long and, and it's telescopes. They go like this and it telescopes out and it serves the same purpose. As I told you, for some reason, I take care of a lot of policemen. And, and when they come in, I always say, can I look at your ASP? It's called an ASP. And I play with, you know, flip it out and stuff like that. But, but remember, you're not allowed to have one, neither am I. But if they get a fracture of the ulna or the radius in the mid shaft, usually they need surgery. And one hour later, if the nurse calls you after surgery and says, Dr. Hill, there's no pulses, compartment syndrome, fasciotomy. All right. Very, very important. Next, let's talk about 
a patient who gets in a fist fight and they punch someone and they're complaining of pain around the fifth metacarpal. Many times they will have a fracture of the fifth metacarpal, sometimes the fourth and the fifth metacarpal, but that is actually called a boxer's fracture. Boxer, like a boxer, like a fighter, a boxer's fracture. Is it common? Oh yes. If you have ever done any boxing or martial arts, you know that you are taught never to utilize your fourth and fifth metacarpals, your knuckles here, because they're not strong, the metacarpals. Always the first two, always the first two. And that is why when you see movies of people hitting other people, what do they always do? If they grab their hand, oh my God, that hurts. Because even if you don't fracture it, it hurts. Because it, it, it's not the proper way from a technique perspective to utilize your fist. Again, is a boxer fracture a common fracture? Yes. Generally speaking, we treat it in a splint or a cast. We usually don't need surgery for it, but you're gonna see it, you're gonna see it. And sometimes you're gonna see people who get boxer fractures, not because they get in a fight, but they get mad and they, they are in their home and they hit a wall. They can put a hole in, 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 in a wall and they can get a boxer's fracture from that by hitting that more on the side than the first two knuckles. All right. Next. There is a fracture that you are going to see so frequently in the emergency room and that is a hip fracture. Patients will come in from a nursing home very commonly or elderly patients, test question, life question, and their leg will be externally rotated and shortened. Externally rotated and shortened. That is a hip fracture, but it can be one of two fractures and you can't tell unless you get an x-ray. One fracture that externally rotated, shortened leg could be is a femoral neck fracture where the femoral neck is broken. The other fracture it can be is an intertrochanteric fracture between the greater and the lesser trochan. So the two fractures that it could be as soon as you see someone with external rotated and shortened extremity from trauma, from a fall, it's either a femoral neck fracture or an intertrochanteric fracture. And the only way you can differentiate between the two is by an x-ray. The treatment of a femoral neck fracture is a prosthesis. Why? Because of avascular necrosis. If you break the femoral neck, generally speaking, you need a prosthesis. If you have an intertrochanteric fracture, generally screws and plates. So it's usually easier to deal with. So remember that, that's very, very important. All right, let's continue. You're sitting in the passenger seat, front seat of a car. You're not wearing your seatbelt, bad car accident, and you fracture your femur, good or bad bad, big amount of force or little amount of force, big, big force. 
Remember that the femur is one of the biggest bones of the body and strongest bones. And the cavemen used to use that as a weapon, as a weapon. Well, if you have a fractured femur, generally speaking, from an orthopedic perspective, you need to operate on that. You need to put a rod in that because it's usually requires that to heal. But a fractured femur can cause two systemic problems. And we talked about these, but I'm gonna repeat it. One is hypovolemic shock. Remember carpet, C-A-R-P-T. Remember I gave you in one of the other lectures, the five areas where you could lose blood from trauma without seeing it on the outside, chest, abdomen, retroperitoneum, pelvis, and thigh. So remember, a femur fracture can give you hypovolemic shock. But a second thing that we talked about also a femur fracture can give you is fat embolus. And guys, how do people present with fat emboli? They are hypoxic, thrombocytopenic, and petechiae all over. And remember, there is no definitive therapy for fat embolus. It's supportive therapy, intubation, steroids, et cetera, et cetera. So remember, a femur fracture in of itself is a lot more potentially than just the femur, which requires surgery. So don't forget about that, all right? 